Well, thank you all very much for allowing me to come here today. This is a, a really quite special occasion for me. And um, the reason I'm doing this today is uh, related to something that happened two weeks ago, which I understand is a rite of passage every parent here has gone through. I have a 17 and a half year old son who managed to have a car accident. He's OK. But uh, he got cited for making a wrong turn, uh, yielding the right away, and uh, the uh, original site. Now, how about a little, did it go off again? Okay. okay. Speak into the mic. Uh, as I was saying, so he had the accident, and the uh, court uh, session, you know, where he's supposed to show up is tomorrow. So I was originally going to present this tomorrow, but everyone was kind enough to allow me to reschedule to do it today. Spoke to the lawyer on Monday, and the lawyer said they want to do everything this afternoon at 3.30. So I will, at 10 o'clock, it's nothing personal. I just have to get in a car and drive back to exotic Toledo to get there for that little thing to get it settled. Now, all that happening, so to speak, uh, it just struck me, of course, that it ends up that I get this opportunity to speak on the, on, on the 100th anniversary of Thurgood Marshall's birthday, which literally to the day, which to me is always these amazing events in life that happen. And so that makes it a very, very special honor for me to be here and have this opportunity to, 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 to talk about uh, Citizen Marshall and uh, Justice Jackson. Now, one other thing that's important about this day and this year is that it's the 200th anniversary, the bicentennial, of the abolition of the importation of slaves into the United States. In 1807, of course, the, the slave trade was, uh, was uh, abolished, but the actual year of the abolishing of uh, slaves being uh, imported in the United States was in, uh, in, in 1808. We'll try it one more time. I won't talk as loud this time. All right, there. Is this OK? All right. Thank you very much. By the way, I want to tell you, it's not your fault. It's my fault. Because every time there's technology with me, they, something goes wrong. It's just part of the way I am. So don't feel, you're, you're doing your job, it's just me. I, I uh, had a presentation to the court I used to work with at the International Court of Arbitration, presuming they spent a lot of money on a case management system. And the day I went to present it, somebody knocked the wire back, and all of a sudden it didn't work. You know, and you have all the judges looking at it and, you know, screen doing that gray thing, this is not working. So I, I really, it's not him, it's me. So anyway, what I wanted to say just to start was that this is a, also a bicentennial year for, uh, for the abolition of slavery. And that's an important aspect of this presentation I'm going to do here. Because in many ways, what was Marshall doing and what was Jackson doing is trying to deal with some of the legacies of slavery in the period when they intersected there in the 40s and, and, and 50s. The other thing about this year is it's the 60th anniversary of a case called uh, Ada Sipwo versus University of Oklahoma. And that has special meaning for me because my dad was working as a stringer for Ebony Magazine, um, who actually was a roving editor at the time, taking photos for them. And he was on his way actually to Nat King Cole's honeymoon in Guadalajara. And he got a call saying, you need to go to Norman, Oklahoma. There's a big case. So he went over there and uh, ended up being in the courtroom and took a couple of shots. And one of the ones, this one that I've got here that we'll talk about in the course of the pre presentation is a shot of Ada Sipwell. If you can see it there, I have some extra ones if people want to take a look. But, but sometimes the angles are there's one or two others about. But the woman here, that's Ada Sipwell, who uh, was from Oklahoma, Chickasaw, Oklahoma. She wanted to go to the University of Oklahoma Law School. And as the system was back then, I'll tell you more about it. She just decided uh, at the time, if a Negro wanted to go to the law school, basically the way it worked in places of segregation is they could go to school outside the state. They couldn't go to the local segregated law school at the University of Oklahoma, et cetera. But that's where she wanted to go to school. So the case there in Norman, Oklahoma, was one of those occasions where uh, Thurgood Marshall, and you can see in the back over her, this right shoulder, Thurgood Marshall at 40 years of age in a courtroom, which is a very rare shot. And you see him sometimes later on after Brown. Oh, sorry. You, 
you see a Thurgood Marshall after Brown, uh, a lot of photos of him, but it just happened my dad took a few photos in the courtroom on one of the rare occasions with him. And then next to Thurgood Marshall is a gentleman who is a question of, uh, uh, people have, I mean, you can go back and look in the record, but I prefer to leave it a mystery as to who he is because there's a lot of debate between my father's local a note at the time said it was a Columbia law professor. Um, there's a lot of debate even at the Supreme Court. I think I created a problem with the Supreme Court when we gave a copy of this picture to the uh, Supreme Court archives because they had very few. And I understood that, you know, there major cases going on, but in the middle of the cases, there were a bunch of justices sitting around, now who was that guy? Is that Griswold or is that? And uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually in insisted it was one person. And then, uh, so anyway, but well, well, uh, I've heard Erwin Griswold, I've heard uh, other people, uh, Walter, uh, uh, I've, I've forgotten if the names escape me, but anyway, a couple people, uh, other potential people. It's not Jack Greenberg, by the way, because Jack Greenberg hadn't started yet. 48, he hadn't started yet at the uh, def uh, legal defense fund. But basically, uh, the thing I, or for my sister and I, we would like about this photo is it's about fighting for her right to dream. That's basically, because the thing about her is she seems to be in this very courtroom setting, dreaming outside. She's the client outside, and you have uh, Thurgood Marshall and the, uh, uh, in there basically with all the legal papers in front fighting for that dream of hers, which is to go to the University of Oklahoma's Law School. So the way I was going to do this presentation is uh, I was going to do it in three parts. First, we, we kind of forget, I think, sometimes today, the nature or the type of oppression that was that time to be a Negro in the United States. I mean, we really, um, I mean, for example, I'm 52, so I was born in, uh, in, in uh, Liberia in 1955, so I was born post-Brown I. Um, and the arc of my life has been this amazing trajectory of things that I've been able to do. I mean, even to be here today is just an incredible kind of passage, I, I have to say. Uh, I ended up being probably the first uh, black in every class I was in when I went through private schools, not public schools, private schools, no, in first grade, second grade, third grade, all the way. It's sort of this arc of life that I've had that is so tied to the things that happened in that period that it's really quite astounding in a way. Uh, I, you know, I sometimes worry that, you know, this is supposed to be a wonderful sort of period for myself, and then after me, you know, what goes on? You know, there's always sort of that, you know, this is like the, the zenith period, but be that as it may, uh, I thought it'd be important for us to go back to the time and think a little bit about what was the nature of the oppression there. So then we'll talk about the cases, the cases in five different areas that where Marshall and uh, uh, Jackson intersect, education, pre-Brown, uh, elections issues, criminal law, uh, transportation um, and housing to some extent. In these cases will be either ones where Marshall was actually arguing the case or it's a case where under the Legal Defense Fund uh, at the NAACP uh, they were, Marshall was intimately involved in organizing the strategies. And then the last thing I'm going to do in this presentation is look at these two men as men of their times uh, to contrast sort of the vision of that time looking focused on civil rights uh, as you know, I, I'm kind of an international guy, so I want to address it from a point of view of human rights. Many things that happened post-1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international con conventions that came in where there was more recognition of human rights. And look, look back at these people through, through that lens, too. So first, let's start with the oppression. So, there was a, there's a professor who's at Albany Law School named Paul Finkelman. I don't know if anyone have heard, any of you have ever heard him speak, but he's a great uh, expert on slavery and in and, 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 and really early American uh, legal history. And he came and made a presentation at Toledo a couple of years ago. And the thing that struck me the most from his presentation was how he presented how intimately connected with the Constitution, its original Constitution pre the 14th, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, pre-Civil War, how implicated slavery was in the Constitution. Now we all know the old three-fifth rule about uh, voting, but one of the things that really, and 
there were some of the other points in the Constitution that really struck me from what he described in that, in, in that were, for example, clearly, of course, there's the provision about slavery being able to stay until 1807, which was a compromise to allow the Constitution to be accepted. But there's other things like, the, for example, the Commerce Clause, the role of the li a limited uh, federal government in terms of interstate trade as opposed to intrastate. A lot of that was related to trade and slaves not being able to be touched by the, uh, the, uh, the central government. The uh, uh, rules against export taxes, so there couldn't be any taxes on slaves being exported. Yeah. The rules about the federal government coming in to deal with insurrections. The worry were slave insurrections. And, and he, he goes through kind of a litany of all these different sections that to us today we don't really we just see them as sort of in interesting language. And what struck me at the time was just how enormous that body of that history, that American slave history was and is in the Constitution as it is. Forget about just the, the ones that seem to speak specifically to it and you know, over the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. It's just the structure of the instrument was so imp in implicated in the tensions within the United States about slavery. So in many ways, when I look at the Constitution today after his presentation, I look at it anew and say, my God, slavery was all over the place. I, I just never seen it, thanks to his, 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 uh, his, his, uh, his presentation. And then he also talked about some of the other things. For example, sometimes today in uh, criminal law, we talk about different uh, ways in which, uh, when, uh, for example, when a, a white person would kill a black person, they would get a lower, uh, um, I keep, the French keeps coming back, I'm sorry, the pen, they, you know, they would get, you know, charged up for, the pen is the word in French, they get a, a, a lower sentence than if it's a black person uh, who has uh, killed a white person and all those things. I'm sure you've heard about those kinds of discussions. Um, well, one of the things that Mr. Finkman talked about was back in the early 17th century, there was a law which was basically the law about the killing of your slave, and it was basically the theory was that a slave owner would never kill his slave uh, out of animus or anything. It would be always be an accident because it's your money, it's your stuff. It's you know you wouldn't kill a, your your horse or your cow out of you know it's like a cruelty to animals kind of notion you'd have to think so that the person therefore could not be charged with a major. Uh, Sent, uh, a sentence or something for doing that because it was unthinkable that a white slave owner would purposely kill their slave. So that therefore the, the vision was more sort of a reduced kind of sentence, an error or something like that, a mistake. Could, it couldn't possibly have been the, uh, the uh, you know, actually just good old murder in the old days. You know. And so you see that these kind of trends from even the colonial period seem to have vestiges, at least I'd say, today or that we we, we, we can have some sense of, of how important, how implicated uh, the role of slavery was inside the United States. Now, I actually got into a little bit of problem with this with uh, Justice Scalia a couple of years ago when he was visiting at uh, Toledo because, as you know, he's an originalist. And I always have a question for originalists. If you don't, originalists are folks who focus on the text of the Constitution and and the, with the thinking of the founding fathers uh, and framers at the time in terms of the way you go and interpret the Constitution. And as it turns out, um, I have a slave ancestor. Her name is Barbary. She was born in 1787 in Africa, and she was sold into slavery in 1800 into the family of the Harrison family. You know the presidents, Benjamin Harrison and uh, William Henry Harrison, but also um, one of the... Harrison's the father was actually one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So with Justice Scalia, I raised my hand and said, I want to, what, as an originalist, do you, I have an objection to originalists, which is that my ancestor was owned by a framer. And so I have a problem with anything they say. It's nothing legal, it's not a great analysis, you know, but it's just I have an issue with that family, so to speak. I just to kind of tweak them. And of course, uh, one of the fun things is Justice Scalia was like, you know, what, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, you he basically came down to saying, look, you know, you either have to accept everything from that period, or you have to be on the barricades. I should be out 
fighting. And I said, look, I'm a law professor. You know, I, I don't, there's got to be something between that. He says, well, if you're a law professor, you have to be logical. I said, all right, yeah, fair enough. And he said, the people signed the Constitution. And of course, everybody, you know, will just raise their hand and say, which people? It was only male landowners, white male landowners who, who were involved in it. So, you know, any whites who weren't landowners, any women, you know, I can go on with that sort of analysis. But he said people with such a sense of, I was sort of like, my God, he really thinks it was the people. I mean, it, it, the way he was reacting to it. So uh, we were at a, a dinner, and after that, we, we kind of went on. We couldn't keep fighting about it. But the important thing that happened at one point is as he was finishing, he said, you need to get over it about slavery. And I was like, OK, you know, you're not going to insult the uh, justice of the Supreme Court. But at my table, there was the wife of a judge uh, who came up judge in, in, in uh, Toledo who came up to me, and she said that her great-grandfather had fought in the Civil War, and he had gotten shot on the Union side, and uh, luckily that his buckle had blocked the bullet, so he lived. But, I mean, she's a, a, you know, a, a, a nice white lady, uh, but she said it was such emotion about the meaning for her of what that great-grandfather had done that clearly these things are not things that you just get over, that it's something that was very deeply involved with the history of her family and sort of the sense of who she was as a person. And she wanted me to know this, you know, that this had been a big moment, and it still was a big moment for her family. So why do I bring you through all of this? I, I haven't gone through Reconstruction. I haven't gone through segregation. I haven't gone through Ku Klux Klan. I haven't gone through Plessy. You know, I mean, I'm trying to give you just the weight of all of that history, that it's clearly live today for her and for me, and, and I think it's, it's, it's live for all of us. Uh, I don't know if some of you saw a PBS program about a week or two ago called Tracks, uh, Traces, of the, Traces of the Trade. It's about a family in uh, Bristol, Rhode Island. The daughter, Katrina Brown, created this film. Yeah, did, did, she, uh, did anyone see that on TV? I commend it to you because her family came to the United States in 1744. And for the first three generations, they were tremendously big uh, business people in the slave business. They were slave traders for three generations. A lot of the family wealth had come from them. And so today, she, she sort of went around with her eight brothers and siblings and went to see the path of what her, they were called the DeWolf family in the time, what they had done. And she, uh, made this wonderful, eloquent speech at uh, her church in uh, Bristol, Rhode Island about that family history, about coming to understand that family history, understanding where, uh, you know, the great-great-grandfather, what he had done, and, and being able to talk about it and, 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 and sort of integrate it in her vision of herself and her family's history. And it became very clear that how powerful it was for her to, 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 to have accepted or, or grabbed onto or understood or integrate to some extent that history. Um, you can go, go over to POV at pbs.org. You can see her, um, her, um, her, 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 her sermon at that Episcopal church. I think she did it back in 2006. So you get this sense of this history, and I'm, maybe in some sense I'm calling up all that history for us to be with us here today in this, in this room, so that we can get a sense of two men who, coming out of that, those histories, happened to intersect for about 14 years there in that time when uh, Justice Jackson was on the court. First, you have Citizen Marshall, born today 100 years ago. He made his various path. I understand one of the big things with him was his Episcopal faith. Um, and in fact, they're looking at uh, being considered for him being uh, made a saint in the Episcopal Church right now. Um, but his Episcopal faith was one of the things that drove him in the way that he had dealt with these cases. Um, then on the other hand, you have uh, Justice Jackson. I love to think of him as the country lawyer from up here and try to imagine someone who, you know, that, that I don't know what you call it, mother wit or whatever, that common sense approach to things that comes from maybe having been out in the rural areas. and. Uh, but at the same time having this enormously and tremendous career. 
but both of them are creatures of that history. Justice Jackson, we heard about last night, used some flip terms that are just sort of very pejorative, if I'm permitted to use your phrase. You know, he, in 1934, in some note he wrote, he said, you know, this thing isn't worth a nigger's note, you know, like that. I mean, it's just a little note that you wrote. It's not that he's a, he's a racist, it's just that's the way people talk. It was not a big deal. You didn't feel a sense of, I shouldn't say this or something. It's just the way it was. The, the, the filters of, gee, maybe this is a problem, were not that strong. So, so the, that tells me he's a creature of his time. Uh, he's, he's a human being who uh, you know, puts on his pants the same way as everybody else does. Um, I, by the way, I remember a wonderful picture of a basketball team where the coach says to the team, don't worry, they put their pants on the same way we do. And then you watch the other guys, and they all jump up in the air and put their pants on in midair and then sit down. And then everybody gets absolutely panicked. Oh, no, these guys are really great. No. So, but who does it make? So Justice Jackson um, was um, a, a man of his time. And you look at Citizen Marshall, and one of the things that I think is important in, in looking at somebody who's going to take on the kinds of tasks that he took on at the time is what was he ultimately trying to do? You could say really quite simply what he's trying to do is that to have Negroes have the rights of citizenship. Nothing more, nothing less. That's this whole sort of essence of, of, of the approach that was taken, designed with uh, William uh, Henry Hasty, Charles Hamilton Houston, how to approach the legal uh, strategy with regards to how to make Negroes have the rights that they should have as any other citizen in the United States. In the context of this enormous history of differences being considered between uh, Negroes and whites, um, going back 300 years, 350 years at the time. I think about that a lot because um, when you look at the cases that come up, you always get this sense of a situation where white people are very uncomfortable with black people in different places in the South. They're just, un I mean, comfortable in terms of high as long as you're in a subordinate position. But really, a lot of nervousness, almost like that slave insurrection fear from back in the days of, 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 uh, of slavery. And so there's an effort, either through the state or through some other mechanism, to set it up so, God forbid, those Negroes won't do anything. They won't have anything. We, we will protect our, our own stuff. That, that sort of, you feel that, that animosity in the air. And you feel the courts always having to address this reality. The courts know. They, People in the courts go to cocktail parties, they hear what people say, they know the dynamics in society, um, and they are, in, in that kind of setting, the court is always in this tension between sort of the ideals, maybe the language that's there in the um, 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, and the reality that they know on the ground in the United States, in the real world, and how to reconcile those two. So let's try to think about some of those situations and some people are, if you're looking for legal principles coming out of these decisions, I'll give them to you briefly, but what I really liked for us to think about is some of the, some of the uh, facts of some of the cases that happened. And what I'm going to do is take some of the cases that were around during the time that Jackson was on the court and then Marshall was either arguing or working to help develop. So for some cases, I have to go a little earlier than when Jackson was on the court uh, because they, they interrelate so well with what actually happened afterward. Uh, afterward. They were pressing. So one of the cases now, I'll just look in education to start with. And I'm not going to talk about Brown because that will be talked about, um, I believe, tomorrow. So um, it's all pre-Brown. I like, in, in a sense, it's like all the period before. And um, so. One of the first cases that I thought was a kind of interesting to look at, State of Missouri, XRL Gaines versus Canada. And again, this is a case, some guy, Lord Gaines, he had this dream, which was to go to the School of Law at the State University of Missouri. So maybe it'd be a courtroom, you'd see this guy sitting there saying, that's what I'd like to do. And as it was at the time, the basic approach of uh, Missouri was that Negroes who wanted to go. By the way, I'm using the term Negro because it's appropriate for exactly that period. So you'll excuse me for, for that. But uh, anyway, 
So he was asserting there was a violation of the 14th Amendment right and not allowing him to go to the state university there. And uh, the state of Missouri was explaining, you know, that you know, we always send people out of state. There are lots of wonderful schools. Nebraska takes these folks, you know, okay, you go to great school at University of Nebraska, you know. All that kind of, those kinds of points were being argued. And so therefore, um, he should be, uh, you know, they, they should be allowed to continue their, their system. Moreover, Missouri created Lincoln University. And there was Lincoln University was a university for blacks there, a wonderful university. And that Lincoln University uh, would, you know, at some point uh, create a law school where the gentleman could go to school, you know, if it, but they'd have to determine at the university sort of if it was feasible or practical. I mean, there's one black guy who wants to go to law school, we're not gonna maybe create the whole, I mean, it's not reasonable to create a whole law school for this one black guy, right? But, you know, if there was some movement in the black community, Negroes wanted law school, well, we get one done over there at Lincoln, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll put, the, put, put the money there uh, and, and get it started. That was sort of the approach of the state of Missouri. Now, you can look at that formally as a, we're an allocation of resources. We're in a period of segregation. Black people and white people can't live together. We've got a wonderful university here. And blacks never wanted a law school. So why should we spend money? Let's be practical. But if they get there, we'll see if there's a number, and then maybe at that point uh, we'll do that. But otherwise, we'll save money. We'll just pay to have somebody do it out of state. And it's got a certain kind of logic that you could understand that uh, if you were in the period and you, you understood the way society was and you understood that how that history of slavery had played, you know, it has a kind of logic to it, I think, anyway. And that's important to understand. You know, I'm not trying to think of people as evil people. I'm trying to think of just as in the logic of their times, what they were thinking. But what happens is you have a guy who comes along who wants to be, wants to go to that school. He breaks the mold, Mr. Gaines in this city. And the logic that's perfectly and impeccable is wonderful, but his logic is a little different. He wants to go to that school. And then we have the assertion of, uh, of his uh, of, uh, of violations of the 14th Amendment. And basically, the court does a very interesting discussion in, in the particular case where it looks at the fact that you had the separate school, Lincoln University, you had the separate school, would create a law school at its discretion. But when that discretion would be exercised, Mr. Gaines could have grandkids. And so the court, in a kind of substantive vision, is saying, we're not duped by this. If there's a Negro who wants to go to school in this state, Lincoln University, maybe he'll have a law school and that'll be nice someday, but it's not clear he's gonna get be able to do that, and so his rights violate. And so the court's kind of taking a step there. This is 1938, you know, this is just saying, no, this is something fishy here. We understand the history, we know how things are here, but the fact that Lincoln University is not automatically having to build a law school, but that it has, to, or because somebody asked, they consider building a law school, that discretion leaves a space that his, need, his wanting to be treated just like every other Missourian is not gonna happen. And so that, kind of the nub of that case is this very carefully constructed structure by the government in the state of Missouri to have one law school, University of Missouri, have Lincoln University for the blacks, have this discretionary possibility for the law school, all that thing. You have sort of the Supreme Court saying, no, we see through all that, and he's never gonna get a chance in hell to go to law school, and, and that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And that's a tension between that you know, equal protection notion and the realities in, in the country. So we understand your situation in Missouri, but you gotta do better than that. That's basically what the message went back. So that's one person's dream. Uh, moving on from there. Well, the final, final result, they reversed the court below and he's supposed to be, uh, he was supposed to be admitted at the school. Okay, yeah. Yes, for him. But it has, it has an effect, of course. It has an effect more broadly. But, but, but he, he got, in the city, the mandamus to have himself be sent in. Okay? Well, what happened is that 
that the judgment of the Supreme Court of Missouri was reversed and the cause of remand for further proceedings not inconsistent. So it went down below to lower court for further, not, for further proceedings that weren't inconsistent with that to have them possibly get admitted into the school. All right. The point I'm just trying to point out is that and there's a separate opinion of Justice McReynolds there who talks about, and he, he uses this phrase, the court well understood the grave difficulties of the situation. Now, the court understands the situation in Missouri at the time, the complications, the, uh, the hesitancy, the, uh, the lack of comfort to have uh, integration occur. Um, and sort of Justice McReynolds is, uh, is a little hesitant about these kinds of situations. Uh, because the law of the land at the time, of course, was separation of whites and Negroes was fine under Plessy. Um, but again, the tension between sort of those separate concerns and the sense of this gentleman having the right to have his dream by being able to, 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 uh, be at, uh, to go to the uh, University of Missouri's law school were resolved in this one moment to allow him to go in. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know whether it was nine, uh, uh, eight one or nine four. Uh, I, I just kind of looked at the cases uh, a, a, as, as they, they went along and I, I wanted to focus on sort of some of the essence of what was inside the decisions. For example, for that one, I really wanted to bring it up because why? In 1948, you have Sipwell, this case here, with the University of Oklahoma where they basically cite back to this case, right, in, in the procurium opinion there. In this case, you have Ada Sipwell, conceitedly qualified to receive the professional legal education, wanted to go to the University of Oklahoma. Their University of Oklahoma, they were willing to put her at a school outside of there. That they didn't have a, they didn't say that, they didn't think that was appropriate. So what they did is that they ordered another judgment of the Supreme Court of Oklahoma reversing its decision saying that she had to go out of state and it was remanded to the court for proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion, which is that her 14th Amendment equal protection rights had to be respected. Now let's see in the simple case what that meant. What that meant is, oh, I, I guess I have to stay here. I think, and if you look in the photo, is we're in a courtroom in Norman, Oklahoma. So what is a decision or a remanding of this case that's in, not inconsistent with this opinion? There were hearings about what would be equal for her. So there were people coming from the University of Oklahoma Law School who said, well, we have a group of professors she can sit with and they'll teach her each subject, the first year contracts and member property with any of your lawyers here and all, and those professors will teach her and we'll have her sit in this one space over here, and then she can get that wonderful University of Oklahoma education with those professors. And then what they did is they had testimony, folks coming down from Columbia, and Erwin Griswold, who was the dean at uh, Harvard Law School at the time, who came down, who was giving expert testimony uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, brought by Marshall about whether that would be the same thing as a equal education that the whites would have at the University of Oklahoma. Is that the same thing? If, for example, Ada Sippel was to sit over there and all of the white people were to sit over here because there was a separate section, is that the same? They're in the same room, same professors sitting there. Is that the same thing? Eating in the same place. How about eating at one table within the same place as opposed to any other table? Is that the same thing? That becomes the debate in this courtroom in Norman, Oklahoma, where there's lots of testimony. And you wonder, in many ways, you look at this as a very therapeutic moment where all of this stuff that are sort of the legacies of, of, of segregation is, is discussed. Well, how can we do this in a way in this setting that people can be comfortable with and it, will it be good enough to meet what the Supreme Court's asked us to do? And it's a dialogue, and it's a painful dialogue, really, if you think about it, because there's questions of privilege, um, there's questions of, uh, of uh, subordination, all that being trying to figure out what's the appropriate way. The end result ultimately is that she was admitted in the University of Oklahoma, and one of the ironies of life, that at the end of her life, she was made a, one of the members of the Board of Regents of the University of Oklahoma Law School.
and he said, the arc of a life, you know, before she died, you know, but this is, you know, it's, a, it's amazing when you think in one life that she would have all of that. But again, the key being that she sought to have, uh, uh, to be allowed to go into that school. Now after that case, you have the cases that in 1950, McLaren, Sweat v. Painter and McLaren versus Oklahoma that uh, are kind of a step farther in this process. The reason uh, about those cases that's a little farther, again, if somebody wanted to go to a law school or educational school, uh, separation but equal being the issue. Um, but one of the things that I think is very interesting about these cases is that you hear in the Supreme Court's decision the discussion of all the efforts made to make it almost the same as if you were in, admitted to the school. That had, and that was kind of, I think, part of the exercise that had happened in the Ada Sipple case. I think I have some of the language here. Um, with Sweat V. Painter, he's going to go to the University of Texas Law School. So he was going to be in University of Texas had 16 full-time and three part-time professors. The student body numbered 850. There are 65,000 volumes in the library there. Then they were creating in 1947 a law school for Negroes. And the fact that the law school here, it was not a theoretical one like in 1938. If they want one, we'll do it. In Texas, they got it done. Uh, uh, send some money, get, them, get that school set up for those kids. You know, and, get, and start putting books in there and all that. And say, what? Now that, te that Texas law school that we started, was no, it had no independent faculty or library. The teaching was to be carried on by four members of the University of Texas Law School faculty, not the 16 full-time and three part-time. They were to maintain their office at the University of Texas while teaching at both institutions. Few of the 10,000 volumes as opposed to the 65,000 volumes in the law school ordered for the library had arrived, nor was there any full-time librarian. Also, the school lacked accreditation. Well, yeah, we're just getting it started here. It's going to take a little time. We've got to get the ABA on board and all. You know, you can hear the whole argument there. Just, you know, we're, we're getting it done here. We're separate but equal. We're, going to, we're, we're not like those folks in Oklahoma or those folks back in Missouri. We're putting our money where our mouth is. You can hear it. I lived in Texas for three years, so excuse my Texas accent. I lived in Fort Worth for a while. So that sort of get her done kind of atmosphere. You can imagine that, that being in there. However, as time went on, The sense of the court was there were these activities, like there was a student body, the scope of the library, availability of law review, and similar activities, and all those things, the University of Texas Law School is, is superior. There's the issues, you cannot look at becoming, going into legal learning and practice, can't be looked at in effect, in isolation from the individuals and institutions with which the law interacts a place where 85% of the population wouldn't be represented. All the white people wouldn't be at the black law school. And all those are judges and all those contacts and you know, you see internships, all those things that people do out of a law school, that wouldn't happen at that brand new fangled black law school. That one comment is, it is unlikely that a member of a group so decisively in the majority attending a school with rich traditions and prestige, which only a history of consistently maintained excellence could command, would claim the opportunities afforded him for legal education were unequal to those held open to petition. In other words, it's saying that no white person would ever complain about the fact that he was going to, that, uh, that uh, this young man would be going to a black school and because he would be getting all the benefits of the University of Texas education uh, and, and wouldn't really care about what was the uh, concerns about what was going on at the, uh, at the black school. The fundamental thing in the case was that these are personal and present individual rights that this gentleman, Mr. Sweat, had and his right to legal education or equivalent legal education was not being provided through the mechanism being suggested by Texas in this newfangled school, so that he'd be allowed to go in and go to the University of Texas. Then there's a McLaurin, Oklahoma case, which is quite eloquent too at the time. This is a gentleman who was admitted to the University of Oklahoma's graduate school education, so he's in. Come on in, fella, you're all right, yeah. Now, what are you gonna do? Well, let's see, you're gonna have your class. Okay. Uh, 
We're going to do this in conformity with the rules and regulations of segregation. All right? So you're going to have to sit apart at a designated desk over there. You're in the school, though. We admitted you. You got to sit in the desk over there uh, in a little ante room adjoining the classroom. So it would really actually be a little desk back there with the door half open so you could look in and see what was going on. All right? Um, he was going to have a designated desk on the mezzanine floor. Remember that library? Okay, yeah, you can use the library. That's your desk in that library here at the University Education Library. But you can't use the desk in the regular reading room. You have a designated table where you're going to eat, and you eat at a different time from the other students, but you still eat in the cafeteria. You know? um, he, at one point, he was put in a section in, which was reserved for color, but that was an issue. So they got rid of the reserve for colored part, and they went on from there to seats, uh, sit in the classroom and all that. So you, what you see is this whole process of sort of trying to deal with the social realities in a practical, quote unquote, manner under Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal. And the Supreme Court, again, finds this untenable. And uh, he, uh, he's, uh, you know, then basically he's supposed to be treated like everyone else in that setting. And of course, you can see where we're coming to. Brown is coming down the road. But this is, again, at the graduate school level, Brown is still a few years out. I hope you see that, that path that the, that the court has gone through from the idea of you've got to have the two, you're not given the two schools, so you have a right. He says, you're, you're, you're given the possibility of a school, but that's not good enough. So, okay, now you're giving them a school, but the school's not good enough. God, this is just not good enough, period. And that's when we come to Brown down the road uh, and, and the problems of separate but equal being overturned. So that is just looking briefly at the education era. You look at this battle on education, and you say, boy, that's a hell of a battle to deal with. But there's other areas. Let's go with elections. You want to have a, a federal election? All right. But you know, in the South, the worry was about all those black voters would create majorities. So we had to adjust the system. You know, we, talk, we talk about reconstruction all that. Adjust the system to dilute black voters first. Literacy tests, those kinds of things, uh, poll taxes, all those things. One of the things that uh, a federal judge, a rank two judge in Cleveland, Ohio, gave me is a copy of a literacy test that people used to have to take back in the day. And this is one of the things I found very heavy about it. It's very similar to the kinds of tests that people have to take when they're trying to get American citizenship. The questions are very similar to if you were somebody coming into the United States and wanted to become American, you'd have you know, you do the naturalization process and prove you're truly American. I always found that a very med uh, interesting meditation on the sense of what blacks were. They weren't really Americans in some sense. You know, they, you had to sort of earn your badge of, of, of Americanness in that setting, similar to the immigrant coming in. So you had, um, in the election setting, you have the actual election, and of course there you have issues of the state action or not, and trying to keep blacks from being able to vote in that election. Well, if you can't keep them from voting in the election, then what you can do is you can have a primary, all white primaries, where there are groups, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party has their own primary, and basically whoever wins that primary ends up being the only candidate in the election. So once you control the primary process, you basically dictated the result of the election. And you make sure it's an all white primary where blacks can't participate, but how do you do that? Well, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, we're private institutions. We're not the government. It's not state action. We're just a private institution. Taking care of our business, it's association, freedom of association, you can see all those things. And so how does the Supreme Court react to that? I'll just say briefly in these election cases, you have this progression from where the courts said, can't do anything wrong in the actual election, uh, but private parties can organize themselves pretty much the way they can. That's back in the 20s. So they come to the point where they say, well, you know, the primaries are so fundamentally integrated in the process of the election that federal law can supervise those primaries too. And so therefore, the rights have to be respected there too. One of the cases in this, and this is one where uh, Justice Jackson was at the time Attorney General, so it's back in 19, uh, it's United States v. Classic, uh, who he, he had represented the United States. It was in a criminal case about these folks who basically, this is the kind of thing. 
pay some blacks vote? Well, the, the organizers of the election mark up their ballots. So they, oh, they're altered ballots, therefore they're, we can't use them. Oh, you voted, yeah, but they're altered. All kinds of little subtle games that, you know, that, that happen. So the end result of all of that is that uh, there was an effort by the Supreme Court in these various cases in this section to do what? To basically keep moving the court's review of what was going on back to a more realistic level, back to what's really going on here, and then saying that's not fair under the 14th Amendment or something like that, or 15th Amendment and, and banning it. If we go to another area, in the criminal case, you have some of the cases in Patton versus the state of Mississippi, um, uh, Cassell versus the state of Texas, but there's a one I really loved, which is Shepard versus the state of Florida. The reason about that is that uh, it was a case of a uh, 17-year-old white girl in Lake County, Florida, who was raped at the point of a pistol by four Negroes, and there was, you can imagine, 1951 in Florida, what would happen then? And uh, it ended up being a, a lynching afterward. But in the particular case, there were this gentleman had been sentenced to death, and questions about prejudicial influence were there. There's questions about um, jury selection, that no Negroes were on the jury and all that. Anyway, it was kind of reversed based on an earlier case called Cassell v. State of Texas, which was the same kind of crazy environment with sort of lynch mob. Yeah, you'll have your fair trial, and then we'll hang you kind of setting. Um, but the thing about this case of Shepard versus Florida is you have Justice Jackson does a concurrence with Justice Frankfurter, which made me feel that I was listening to the um, country lawyer, because there's one point in there where the judge, you know, he concurred with the decision of the court, but he says, for the court to reverse these convictions upon the sole ground that the method of jury selection discriminated against the Negro race is to stress the trivial and ignore the important. And the important was this was not a criminal trial in this kind of crazy emotional environment where these guys were trying. It was not a judicial process. And that is what the fundamental flaw is. is it was not that there wasn't a, uh, a Negro in the jury selection process, but that this was not a legal process. And I'm gonna come back to that uh, when I get to the international setting with regards to, to, to Justice uh, Jackson. Beyond that, in motor vehicle, interstate transportation, Morgan versus Commonwealth of Virginia, in that setting, again, we separate but equal on the, on the bus and the requirements in interstate trade, that we can't have different rules for different states. I don't know how folks get along in Virginia and folks get along in Rhode Island or don't get along in Rhode Island, but we can't have, we can't have one rule that when you're in interstate transportation, people can sit wherever they want because it's too complicated for us to have people jumping up and down as you cross each border to, 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 to comply with the local rule in, 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 that, in, in, that, uh, in, in that particular state. And then, of course, the last one that I have in here is on the housing area. And, of course, if you remember in your history, the, uh, there was the great migration of blacks from the south up north to all the different cities in the north. In the south, you had all of this legislated state action discrimination put in place. In the north, when numbers of blacks started to move north, there were efforts to legislate that, and there were cases that were brought that uh, knocked down any kind of state action efforts. So I teach contracts in the first year. What happened? Magically, contract, private ordering. People wrote contracts that said, we don't want to have blacks, and you know, you agree not to sell your house to a black. That's free. Come back and write up right here, right now. Other person signs it, we're okay. It's not state action. It's private individuals in their deal for their uh, their, their, their area and all that. And of course we had the series of cases, Shelley v. Kramer and other ones after that, where it was decided that courts would not enforce those racially restrictive covenants. Why did that thing arise? Because blacks moved north. You couldn't do this kind of state actions, actions that had been done in the south and the north that kept being struck down. So that still that need to keep that separation in that period arose. Uh, and the Supreme Court got behind the social realities to see what was going really on here and said, no, we can't have the courts enforcing these uh, private covenants. 
that was a progression too. It started out with the view, well, these are private actions, state or state action. We have no role under the 14th, 15th Amendment to do anything. So, so having taken you through, um, and I see, I think I have maybe five minutes left, so I'll just finish up with this last part. I hope, in having looked at these various areas of the uh, cases that went up during the time that Justice Jackson was on the court and Citizen Marshall was arguing these cases, that you get a sense of the problems in education, the problems in elections, the problems of criminal law, problems of transportation, problems of housing that blacks were dealing with at the time, Negroes were dealing with. And then Marshall was taking on and taking these cases and bringing them to the court. And in this short period, you have so many areas of U.S. life for Negroes in the South, in the North, wherever, that Marshall was trying to do to address so that Negroes would have their citizenship at the same level as whites. And Justice uh, Jackson was there, and Justice Jackson, I think, looking at that particular criminal case, understood. Let's look at what's really important. Let's be practical if we can get there. And, and he manages it in, in, that, in that concurrence to do it. Now, I would end it with the last part, which is talking about civil rights and human rights. Both of these men are men of their time, just like all of us are people of our time. One of the things about that time is that in these decisions, you never hear a discussion of sort of international law, another thing I teach. You never hear about human rights. You never hear about that kind of language because the language really didn't exist. It started in 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It went on from there. There are other uh, covenants, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights. All of these international instruments start to play out where what happened is that states were recognizing on the international plane they had obligations that were rights that inured to the benefit of human beings because they are human. Not because they're a citizen or a non-citizen or anything, but just these are rights you have as a human. Now, what does that mean if you can't enforce it? Yes, everyone understands the problem in enforcement. But the key thing is that the idea of just having rights, not because you're an American citizen or under the Constitution, but just because you're a human being, really didn't start to crystallize until after that. Nuremberg was part of that, um, and, um, and the human rights movement that we had the last 50 odd years or so. One of the things, and I'll finish up with this, is I in, had an opportunity to sit in at the United Nations uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination hearings on the U.S. periodic report, looking at uh, sort of how, is, how has the U.S. moved towards complying with its uh, obligations under that convention itself to eliminate racial discrimination. And one of the fascinating things about that discussion is you had people from around the world saying, look, the United States is kind of the image of where we're all going to be. Europe is getting to be multicolor, multiracial. Out in Asia, that's happening. All, all of these different places that are happening. So how the US does it is very important to us. In Brazil, how they're gonna deal with all the different groups of people there. And so it's very important for them to see how the US did it. Marshall, through his cases and through his legal efforts, set the legal foundations for a lot of what happened. But at this meeting in Geneva, one of the comments they made is we take too legalistic an attitude towards the obligation under the treaty. That maybe our vision should not be much broader than just the legalistic attitude, sort of pulling the social justice side, maybe pulling something that we might have heard in Martin Luther King, for example, and that sort of social movement approach to it. That really, the, that the process of integrating people of different racial uh, groups is a broader one. And so that may be the task that they couldn't do because it wasn't part of the language of their time, but it may be part of the task of our time is to try to translate those sort of international norms we've accepted into our system under our Constitution in a way that vindicates those obligations that the United States has accepted. So we started with oppression. Told you a lot of stories in different cases. It was sort of a very difficult period. And finished up with trying to give you just a little hint of that international stuff. I encourage you to study international law. There's a lot going on. There. And I thank you for your time and your patience with me. And uh, I guess I should stop there. Let's see. How am I doing? <laughs> 10 o'clock. All right, here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I know, I know he's got to run to deal with uh, making sure his son uh, gives an appropriate uh, jurisprudence today. Yeah, there we go. 
Uh, tomorrow we will pick up on the Brown versus Board. Uh, Professor John Barrett is going to agree with, uh, join me, and we're going to talk through the unpublished opinion of Brown versus Board, where we'll be uh, participating in a, a, there'll be a speech that we previously recorded given by E. Barrett Prettyman, Jr., and that'll be shown tomorrow. And then Friday, John will be uh, sharing some biographical information on uh, Robert Jackson, and that is in your program. So those are the events forthcoming. Uh, there is a, I circulated a little bit of a piece which showed Thurgood Marshall here at Chautauqua in 1957. So there is a, uh, just so you know, while we're celebrating and commemorating the 100th birthday of Thurgood Marshall in 1957, he came to Chautauqua and spoke about uh, integration and, and uh, the uh, various constitutional issues that were forthcoming. So with that, I say thank you so much, thank Ben, you. for participating I, today. I, if it, I have, I brought a few of these. You're welcome to keep them. All right, yeah. You too. Great. Right here. Okay, this will be yours here. All Thank right. Is that okay? That's true. But it's just something. Hi, hi. I was just going to tell you that I'm Joe Taylor. I'm a senior judge with the Court of Civil Appeals in Oklahoma. Oh, okay, okay. And I served on the Court of Appeals with Justice Tom Colbert, okay. who's presently on our Supreme Court. Okay. The first African American yeah. member of our Supreme Court. Yeah. And uh, Thurgood Marshall is his hero. Yeah. And, uh, Great, uh, great guy, and um, he and I both went to this law school. Oh yeah! And, uh, and now he's um, you're talking about the art. Yeah. The yeah. Now he's on. He's going to be. He is on track to be our chief justice. Yeah. Right? It's so just the arc of life. It's amazing, you know. You know. Here, take it oh yeah. Now, yeah. And here's a fun thing. This guy over here. You see this? Yeah. I, 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 uh, guy told me he knew him. Well, down in Fort Worth, the guy said he knew him. I forgot what his name was. But his folks owned a dry goods store in Eden, Oklahoma. And they must have heard there's going to be a big case in Norman, so you need to get over there and see, because he was thinking about going to law school. You know, so that's why he, so he showed up there, right there, being in the front row to see what was going on. And he went on, he went to law school, finished first, first year law school, they get over home, and then he decided to go back to the family for dry goods business. And he decided, I know who that guy is. You know? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, really. Thanks so much, Ben. Oh, that was terrific.